relationship between the entrenched status quo interest of the state, of the ruling elites, and of the ordinary people being represented by the Chief Justice. So these and other difficult questions this paper has sought to answer through looking at the relationship between the rule of law and the very fundamental relationships of private property and the state. A great constitutional scholar of England, Dicey, Albert Van Dicey, has been credited as formulating the meaning of the rule of law. In his first, he formulated three particular aspects of the rule of law. In the first sense, no man is punishable or can be lawfully made to suffer in body or goods except for distinct breach of law, established in the ordinary manner before the ordinary courts of land. In the first sense, the rule of law is explained as a protection or remedy against discretionary powers of persons in authority. There are three themes which are clearly distinguished. There can one, there can be no punishment without pre-existing law. Two, ordinary courts are the proper institutions where all cases must be heard. And three, discretion and law are antithetical. The second uh, premise on which his rule of law, his definition of the rule of law rests is that everyone is equal before the law, regardless of rank or socio-economic condition. The third is that all source of law derives from judicial decisions of the ordinary courts of the land. Now these three prime space are seemingly very simple definition of the rule of law. And throughout the common law world, these three definitions are taught in all law schools without exception. But what people fail to realize and don't know is that these three themes are loaded with, with concepts like the first uh, definition of that no one should be deprived of life and property, the concept of individual freedom, the concept of private property, the concept of state, and more importantly, it doesn't address the question why does the state, why does the individual need protection of the state? Why is the state acting in an arbitrary manner against the individual or his property? The second is equality before the law. This definition offers no, it doesn't help us at all in explaining whether it's formal equality, i.e. that if I'm a millionaire and if, 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 if the other man next to me is, is, is a poor man, does it recognize equality in content or just that it's formal equality? And if not, why not? The third, the third theme, which is the uh, independence of judiciary goes to the very heart of the modern democratic system, which is dividing power into three, uh, three powers, dividing one sovereign power into three, legislature, executive, and judiciary. Again, this is rooted in a very negative worldview of human beings, that power is dangerous, that power left to itself will destroy society. Hence, diffuse the power, divide the power between the executive, divide it between the legislature, and divide it between the Judiciary. So my my research was studying the primary texts from Hobbes all the way down to Marx, and ex extrapolating the principles of the relationship between law with property on the one hand, the, the relation between the individual and property, and the relationship between private property and the state. I will not bore you with the uh, intensive study. Of, of the textbooks, but I will give you my synopsis of the conclusions. My research shows how private property law in the state formed the fundamental themes in the works of classical thinkers. They discovered not only that private property and law were products of human activity, but also gave detailed historical account of its trajectory and noted at several instances the contradictions and antagonism associated with private property in the state. Hobbes and Locke, for example, demolished the natural law to tradition and rooted private property on the state on the basis of human made law. While Hobbes stated his theory in favor of the state, Locke proposed a more radical protection of private property from divorcing it outright from government interference. It appears at first sight as if Hobbes and Locke stood at polar ends, with Hobbes stressing on a strong state and Locke on a weaker one. This is not so. They both sought to radically separate private interests or property from the authority's all interested claims. One, by divorcing the state completely from private interests, and the other, by exiling the state uh, completely from the sphere of private interest. 
as, as the bourgeois system or the capitalist system matured, we see in Montesquieu and Rousseau a critique of the entire bourgeois system, uh, and especially a critique of the problem associated with private property. How private property has a tendency to split civil society and to create tension in our society due to its um, inherent nature of inequality that comes with it. Montesquieu saw the concept of liberty being threatened by the dangers of excessive inequality. This is because for Montesquieu, um, liberty as a concept, as a political concept, was fundamental. He analyzed the world's legal systems, but his fundamental theme was how does each legal system protect liberty. But he said that in, in, a, in a bourgeois system, liberty cannot uh, be protected unless it is accompanied hand in hand with the concept of frugality. So he devised a system which, at, at, on the one hand, argued that democracy should be frugal and that the uh, distribution of wealth should be even, because that is the only thing that will keep a democracy alive. Uh, Rousseau, on the other hand, was a thoroughgoing critique, and uh, he saw he saw society being threatened by the dangers of excessive uh, inequality, and, and and this inequality itself was he found besetting in the bourgeois system of private property. देखें आप बातें ना करें अगर आपको दिलचस्पी ना हो तो आप बाहर चले जाएं या खामोशी से सुनो। सारे in Adam Smith, we find a thoroughgoing critique of the mercantile order, a, a materialist theory of jurisprudence, and a sociological explanation of the contradictions of capital. Smith sought to give back those wealth producing freedoms to civil society, which the merchant classes were usurping in their drive towards monopolization of domestic and in international markets. Hegel saw the realization of the social problems in an overdeveloped and an overly rational state exemplifying the deeper contradiction between state and capital. Hegel's obvious preference was for the state domination over capital and simultaneously over all other classes. Marx completely transcended this age-old debate and came to the conclusion that there could be no reconciliation with private property in the state. Uh, he did so by tracing the root form of private property in its economic and juridical aspects and in his view, the tensions and contradictions of society that were premised on private property relations could not be reformed or restructured, and had, there had to be a complete break with them. So, what we've seen in Dicey is, is what I call a minimal conception of law. A minimal conception of law is shown in the government limited by law in formal, i.e., legal legality, but not equality, uh, not equality in content and the rule of law by man and not man. This is not to reject Dyson's concept, but it's just to show that it is one such theoretical expression of, of the rule of law rooted in his time. Dyson's primary concern was the rise of socialism, as he was writing in the late 1800s. Uh, and he used the concept of rule of law to counter socialism and communism. So the conception, this minimum conception of the rule of law, which, which, which Dicey has espoused, cannot and does not explain the role and function of the rule of law in a, an authoritarian or racist uh, re regimes. For example, fascist Germany or the racial se segregation of the United States. Although in both these regimes, there was rule of law. But history shows us that freedoms are always hard won and always characterized by people's struggles for further emancipation from uneven distribution of freedom, equality, and recognition of dignity cannot come without hard-won struggles. And Pakistani example is before us. That despite there being rule of law in a formal sense, that despite there being protections in a formal sense, Pakistan went through a severe uh, uh, crisis of the rule of law. And in my view, the, if we have to define it theoretically, in, in my view, there is a thin concept of the rule of law which Dicey represents. And this thin concept is always going to be supported by the ruling elite, by people who have moneyed interests in society, who have tangible interests. They will always promote a thin concept of the rule of law, so that there is least of all friction between their vested interests and the state. 
Because you see, the state has its own dynamics. It has its own claim on capital. Uh, and then there's a thick concept of, 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 of the rule of law, which is a substantive rule of law, which, which means that, the, which, which believes in social justice, which believes in redistribution of wealth. And this concept of the rule of law will always belong to the people. And it is the tension between this thin and thick concept that we've seen, uh, 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 we've seen in, the, in the example of Pakistan's struggle. Um, no one can say that Musharraf was not the sovereign. He was the president of Pakistan. He, the, the, there was a, uh, a parliament, an, an elected parliament. And yet, that parliament, because of the judicial activism of Chief Justice Chokli between the years 2005 and 2007, which opened the floodgates for this thick conception of the rule of law that I'm arguing, opened the floodgates for people to come before the courts and vent their frustrations for real issues of people to come before the courts, like the Steel Mills case, like the Mokhtar Mai case, um, like the hundreds of cases that uh, Chief Justice has picked up uh, relating to women's uh, rights abuses and, and bondage children in, in, in the rural areas. Um, and hundreds of such cases which really sent, sent shudders down the spines of the ruling and then, but the ruling elite reacted legally. They did not, they did not assassinate the chief. They filed a reference abuse. They invoked a minimal conception of the rule of law. And fortunately, that conception was countered with the struggles of the, the lawyers and the judges and the civil society. And hopefully, with the trial of Musharraf, I think this minimal conception of rule, rule of law as a concept that governs the mentality of the ruling elite of Pakistan will, should receive another daily Thank you.